Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. It's quite a day. How are busy, you? busy day, isn't it? Had to turn off the radio, turn down the TV, and uh, turn the focus to the podcast for a few minutes here. I guess we're just going to do a quickie and a little more depth one and a little bit later on. Indeed, we're going to do our first impressions po- podcast, Bruce. So we're yeah. not going to we're not going to try to give thumbs up or thumbs down on whether they made the right moves necessarily. Although we might get into that, but just kind of first impressions because there's so much to digest here. Mm-hmm. There's a lot happened that has happened with the orders, and it was frankly the orders were left to to scramble like crazy after Adam Larson jilted the the team and went to Seattle. It just created this massive crater hole in the orders lineup for a team that wants to win. Now you lose your best shut down D-man, your best cycle buster. And not only that, he's on the right side. It just That was just a total punch right in the nose. And, and was it a knockout punch? We, it might be. It might be a knockout punch for the Edmonton Oilers um, right now with, with a team that needed to win right away. But they've been scrambling, and this is what they came up with. So let's get into that. Yep. First of all, let, let's have you, do you think it was a knockout punch? Losing well, Larson. it certainly triggered the avalanche of changes on the right side of the defense. I mean, I, everything that's happened subsequent, you can point your finger directly to the loss of uh, Adam Larson. And some might even say that the acquisition of Duncan Keith even preceded the loss of Adam Larson and in some way triggered it. Uh, we don't know that. but uh, Or it could be the other way around. That, that the uh, they Keith put was... Keith on the uh, protected list and instead of... Uh, uh, dealing with Larson internally and putting him on the list, but however you however you slice it, there's been a hell of a lot of changes on the Oilers' back end, and uh, with a uh, clear focus on the immediate future as opposed to uh, looking down the road in in uh, as significant way as they had been doing. Bruce, isn't it just as fair to say that because we don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what triggered what? And Keith's signing here, the the trade for a veteran like Keith could have been triggered by them thinking we're going to lose Larson. It could, it's just as he, because we don't have that information and the timing is so tight on, on all this stuff that it's just as he, it could be one or the other and we don't know. Is that fair? We don't know. We don't know. It's fair. I, I think that's fair. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. It's, we're both, le- so if you like want to. I originally the- said some would say that the, the acquisition <laughs> okay. of Keith is what triggered the avalanche of what followed. Okay. And I would say definitely that the, the departure of Larson, whatever triggered that, the departure of Larson has unleashed a uh, maelstrom of, of activity to do with uh, specifically the right side of the order's defense, which has nothing to do with Duncan Keith. Yeah. So in my dark moments when I'm thinking darkly of Ken Holland and Oilers management, I, I will side with a, yeah, they made it, they, went for Keith and they lost Larson because of it. But when I'm in a more op- optimistic and sunnier mood, I might think, well, you know, they, they knew they were losing Larson, so they needed to bring in Keith. So you can kind of, <laughs> you can kind of pick, uh, pick what side you want to take if you're the half full Except or half empty kind of fan. They're not the same player at all. They, they really are not. not and, and, yeah, they're not. Listen, yeah. there's probably five players in the NHL who are like Adam Larson, you yeah. know, Maybe ten on the right side, you know that kind of that quality of shutdown demon. I, I there's not more than ten, and uh, he was a, that was a real loss, and we've talked about that. So yeah. let's talk about what happened today. What right. are, we're going to do first impressions? What is your let's we'll start. The only new news on Zach Hyman is that he got a new no. The details of his contract came out, mm-hmm. and it's he's not getting paid much this year. And I'm guessing it's because there's such a big clawback on escrow this year that the agent didn't want that. Mm-hmm. He gets paid most in the next like two, three, four years, five years, and then he gets paid a little less. And there's and the bonus structure goes up at the end of the contract. There's a no movement clause on the contract for the first five years, and then there's in the last two years there's ten teams he can be traded to. And uh, I don't, I don't really think no movement clauses are that big a deal on these long-term contracts. If the player doesn't work out, you can't trade him anyway, right? Unless he wants to move, unless things have become so sour that he wants to move, like in the Milan Lucic case. So the no movement thing doesn't really phase me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
What so any any first impressions on the on the contract and you know final impressions on him coming here? Uh, yeah, I I haven't parsed the contract in great detail other than to to take in the fact that it wouldn't be easily moved and it wouldn't be easily bought out. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's got uh, limited no trade in the last couple of years, but he's also got bonuses coming in the last couple of years. And every every bonus dollar in the at the end of a contract is a dollar that cannot be reduced by buying it out. So uh, uh, they're in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, on on uh, Hyman's five, uh, seven years, $5.5 million, no sixth round pick to Toronto. And I'm really, really hoping that Matt Faye Petrov turns into a superstar and scores a hat trick every time he goes to Air Canada Centre. But that's just me being a fan. That's Why the pick Petrov? Oilers, that's the pick the Oilers didn't trade to Toronto because Kyle Dupas was being a bit of a... Hard ass. Just, Oh, Kyle, I, I thought Kyle I thought he was cutting out. off his nose to cut to spite his face. You know, he could have got some. He could have got something for Hyman, and instead he accepted nothing. So Kyle, dumbass. Live All right, well. I won't go there. But uh, <laughs> and I, I generally like Kyle Dubas. But I, uh, if I were a Toronto fan, which I used to be, I wouldn't be going, "Oh, well done, Kyle. You got nothing instead of something." I'd be saying the exact opposite. It was a little bit to get nothing when when you yeah. could have got something doesn't really make sense because does it really matter to you that much that tr- that Edmonton's going to get a cap benefit because there's thirty you're competing with thirty other teams as well and they all get the same benefit except Edmonton so you've given up the draft choice and all the other thirty teams have gotten the same advantage you've got so mm-hmm. whatever anyway Here, let's move on from Kyle Dubas my uh, first impression my first impression of the Hyman trade was pretty negative. This is based on the Oilers' long and horrible history of free agent signings, which have blown up in their face. Sheldon Surrey, Eric Belanger, and in blown up in one way or another. Benoit Pouliot, Mark Fain, Andre Sekera, Milan Lucic. It's just Boyd Gordon. It's just on and on and on. So any Oilers fan who had that reaction to this signing, that is completely understandable. These signings often do not work out. And the first thing that pops in your head is this isn't going to work out because they usually don't. Maybe this will be different. And and I and I did come around to the win now idea that you got to win now uh, with this Oilers team with Connor McDavid having five years left and Dry Settle four years left. This is the time to win. There is a time for everything under the sun, Bruce, and this is the time for winning for the Edmonton Oilers. So that's why the Larson thing hurt so much. The one thing that cheered me up, Bruce, about Hyman, and I mentioned this previously, was some of the Toronto fans, the, the, the mm-hmm. love letters that Toronto mm-hmm. Maple Leaf fans have been writing to Zach Hyman um, in the last little while with him leaving town. And I'll just read a couple of them just really quick. Here's from Diane Reno at Diane Reno. He is the heart of the team, an ambassador for this team. They need that. Um, from Jeff at GRAD27. Heart and soul player that the Leafs will miss dearly. Happy for the person. Sad to see him go. Unfortunately, that's the flat cap world. And finally, from L at Hyman Hype Man. I fucking love Zach Hyman. You could always count on him. I hope he gets paid and has all the success in the world. So this was the overwhelming sentiment from Toronto Maple Leaf fans about this player leaving. It's somewhat yeah. similar mm-hmm. to the, the the feelings that Oilers fans have about Adam Larson. I, I mean, it didn't come out as strongly because it was so unexpected with Larson right. and it was such a gut punch that, you know, but this sentiment, this kind of feeling is what we have about Adam Larson and about Ethan Bear. Many fans have about Ethan Bear as well. Bruce, let's move on to Bear. What Let's do you think move on it? to some breaking news. Jujar Kara signs a two-year deal with Chicago Blackhawks. All right. What do you think? First impression. Uh, good luck, Jujar. So long. Yet another developed Oilers prospect that we've waited years for to be, uh, you know, a heart and soul member of our team that's been moved along this summer in the interest of change. Also, Philip Grubauer, six-year, $35.4 million with Seattle Kraken. Yeah. Don't they have two? What do they have? They got uh, three they, goalies. Yeah, they got Dreger, and, and they uh, yeah, and they got another. They got a, a kind of a prospect goalie from Ottawa, Decord, and the other guy was a uh, pretty good goalie too, as I recall. So um, he might be on the market. Well, the third one, guy. one of them might be. Yeah, one yeah. of them might be. Dreger, yeah. unlikely. Well, maybe Dreger's on the market all of a sudden, Bruce. 
Kraken also signed Alex Wenberg, who was a potential 3C candidate, three years, 13.5 million. So anyway, this is probably old news to those watching this podcast. Let's move on. My reaction to the Ethan Bear. No, no I, I want to react to Kara. Yeah. Kara my first, I got to do my first impression of Kara, which yeah. is, uh, listen, he was developed here, Bruce. It's not like he didn't have a chance to, to grab hold of a spot. He came very close to doing that. Grabbing a core 12 spot as the third line center, he came close to it. And in the end, uh, injuries set him back and he and he didn't get it done in the playoffs and and he didn't uh, grab that spot because of it. That doesn't say, though, that he can't rebound and be a third line center, a core 12 player for Chicago this coming year. So um, I have mixed feelings about it because for that reason that Zach, that Jujar Carrick could still be a core 12 player, third line center for Chicago. We don't know. We'll see who we get to replace him. I guess that's the key. Ethan Bear, first impressions of his of that trade. Uh, well, I have two different impressions. One was of the departure of Ethan Bear, which is uh, uh, a, a big disappointment. Personally, I was a big fan of uh, of the player, and uh, I, uh, you know, I was a big fan of the the draft pick and watching the development, watching him slowly maturing into a a solid NHL defenseman under club control at a decent price with, uh, uh, you know, a bright future in front of him. And all of a sudden he was caught under the Adam Larson uh, avalanche that brought in a number of other players and uh, seemingly forced the hand of Ken Holland to, uh, uh, to move him along. I will miss him. He was my wife's favorite player. She will miss him. And I know there's lots of other people in the oil country that feel the same way. And unfortunately, there's a few others that feel a very different way. And they can um, go back under their rocks. Um, do you, do you, for, do you, Bruce, do you think there's a lot? Like, I don't see a lot of that on, like, well, a lot there's, of the races. There's, stuff a bunch on of it on, there's a bunch of it on Facebook this morning, David. And it's, oh, it's, geez, it's just that's garbage. so gross. Oh, I didn't so, know that, Bruce. That really is disturbing mm-hmm, yeah. and gross. I haven't. Uh, seen, I've been on Twitter, so I haven't mm-hmm, seen it there. Right. But I yeah. to hear that is like, mm-hmm. I I, I hope I just if that's Oilers fans, that's that's really disappointing. Maybe well, it's a, whoever. Yeah, it's all right. anonymous, right? So you never even know. Oh, yeah, but yeah, oh, that's yeah. just gross. Anyway, uh, in terms of a trade from a hockey trade standpoint, the Oilers got something they desperately need, which is a decent bottom six player. They haven't had enough of those. Their bottom six has been like crushed for years. And Warren Fogle, they got a guy who's uh, got three years, 200 games under his belt, 25 years old. Uh, he's a player that uh, uh, um, looks like a little bit of a late bloomer in terms of his, his development path. He went to college. He came back to junior. He played an overage year, um, played a year in the minors. But then he was ready for the NHL, and he's done well. And he's He's like in Carolina, so I, I know your view on shot shares. It's the whole team, not just the one guy. But he's always been on the bottom six, and he's been in the 54, 55% range throughout his career. And that's not just shot share. It's expected goals and actual goals. So uh, he, when he's on the ice, the like Hurricanes, mind you, with a great defense behind him, uh, outscored and outplayed the other team. And that is something Edmonton desperately needs. Uh, the downside is that he's a restricted free agent with a with a floor qualifying platform of two point one five million dollars. So when they extend him, it's going to be for more than that, uh, and uh, it, you know it's 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 going to be costlier to the uh, salary cap than the player they gave up in him for one for one. And the other thing that's you know slightly puzzling at face value is that Fogel wasn't protected by Carolina in last week's expansion draft, as opposed to Ethan Bear was protected by Edmonton. So does that speak to the fact that uh, uh, Edmonton gave up the better player or that Carolina had the deeper roster? And uh, I tend to look at door number two and just say Carolina is just that much better than Edmonton, that that it's not wrong to consider trading for one of their unprotected players. Is Carolina one of the places where they have questions about the shot on goal stats like there's some places where there's real questions about the validity of the shots on goal stats that are being like we saw that with Montreal this year when the owners would go in there and they'd have 15 shots at net and they'd be credited with eight or something and 
and uh, I'm not sure if Carolina is or not. Not to my knowledge, New York Rangers used to be the worst, and I think they I think they actually had to deal with that because it was so out of whack. But uh, uh, I'm not aware of any sort of really notorious buildings for that kind of thing. But uh, uh, I can't rule it out because I don't know for sure. So my first impression is. Um, it's it, it. Ethan Bear was developed by the Oilers, and he's had a couple of years. By the way, we by the way we measure by the way I measure hockey. How much? How many great plays is he involved in in terms of creating great eight chances, and how many mistakes does he make on great eight chances against? Ethan Bear has been pretty good mm -hmm. um, these last two years. Pretty good, especially for a young player, often thrust into a difficult role. Mm -hmm. He he did very well in his first year. Uh, paired with Darnell Nurse to to the point where I was thinking, like the owners have a top four D man here. Oh, too. This year he came in and he cratered in the first ten games. He was really weak, and it might have been due to the some kind of maybe he didn't train hard enough in the summer. I don't know. That's one of the ideas floating around that we've heard in the past. Well, I, compared I to the previous year, compared to the super previous trained year. in the summer. Yeah. So there's that. You know, it's the sophomore thing, and it didn't. It wasn't just him. It was Caleb Jones. It was Connor Yamamoto. You know, all three. Yeah. Of them. They needed to work harder, probably all three of those guys, because they didn't, none of them, none of them picked up and did better in their second year than in their first. And maybe they just thought it was going to be a little too easy. And Standards. they all got got a Sorry. slap in the face there, Bruce. Standard Stand sophomore jinx. So now two of them are gone and that's done. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I want to, so with Bear, he, um, just want to finish my thought on, on his, how his year went here. Yeah. He, he, um, he got better though, Bruce. As oh. the year went along, oh, he sure. got more consistent. He started to look like the Ethan Bear we had seen and maybe even took a slight step up in his game. Like he was playing very strong two-way hockey. And sometimes in a, like that was starting out as, as a bottom pairing guy. And then he worked his way up the lineup. He, he was good. He was back. And then came the playoffs. And I wonder if this is what um, soured, I'm guessing the Oilers coaches on the player, soured the Oilers organization on the player somewhat to the extent that they would move him is that um, he had some rough, very rough, he didn't play that well in the playoffs and he had some very rough moments and key moments. Mm -hmm. So he, that's two years in a row where he hasn't performed for the Oilers in the playoffs. And you got to think, you're Dave Tippett, you have one year left on your contract. You've mm -hmm. got to win in the playoffs this year if you're going to stick around. Are you going to make a bet on Ethan Bear? And that might have been one of the factors. So, so the question is, one of the questions is if Adam Larson had stayed, would they still have moved Ethan Bear? And I'm starting to wonder if that if that wasn't the case, that they Maybe. they might have moved him anyway. I think with Larson moving out, they wanted to get a different mix. They needed to try to replace that. And having Bouchard, Bear, and uh Barry in the end wasn't the right wasn't the right mix for that. So maybe that's why they traded him when we don't know. I don't know. Well, if you're gonna trade out everybody who struggled in the playoffs the last two two years, the line forms at the right, you know. They lost. Their, they <laughs> lost. They won one game and lost seven. Uh, ah, yeah. fair comment. Bear, Bear was part of the problem. I'll, I'll readily admit he had a couple of very costly turnovers against the Jets. Yeah, and the one guy who wasn't Adam Larson wasn't really the, oh, in the on well, the first year he was hurt. This year he was. I thought Larson was actually pretty good in the playoffs this year, but uh, anyway, but he made some right. major mistakes. Tyson Berry signing three years, four point five million. Bruce, first impression. <sighs> We re-signed the wrong guy, but that was triggered by the Larson situation. You know, Adam Larson left an Adam Larson-sized hole, and Evan Bouchard was waiting in the wings to fill a Tyson Berry-sized hole. So now we have, you know, a, a surf, surplus of uh, of defensemen of the one type and a shortfall of defensemen of the other type. And so that, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean... The price isn't too bad. They, they did manage to whittle him down to three years. Apparently, the battle was between three Oilers offering three, Barry wanting four. And the uh, the AAV was under five million, which uh, kind of was an over-under line that I kind of was watching. So I got a little bit of a, you know, a decent raise, but they didn't break the bank. Um, they're going to need him to keep performing offensively. And he's got some very sort of troubling splits in his stats where he plays a lot with McDavid, but McDavid plays better, has better results without Barry. 
and Barry has not good results without McDavid. And you know, it's it's uh, we're going to learn more. It's just it's another in a long line of Oilers finding a free agent on the market at something of a bargain, signing him for a year, and then liking him so much that they give him a multi-year extension with a big raise. You know, Chris Russell's on that list, Alex Chase on. Uh, I don't think I got them all, but that's, you know. That, Cassian kind of, but he, Cassian yeah, was around longer. Kind of, kind of, yeah. yeah. yeah so make- it, it, it's, uh, uh, we'll see. You know, in the other cases, the, the other shoe dropped during the longer term extension. And uh, we'll see uh, how Barry is in his early 30s. He's uh, He turned 30 years old this week. Yes. So. 30, 31, and 32. That's not too old. And he's a fairly not good ancient, skating defenseman, no. and he's mm-hmm. a finesse defenseman. So I'm not... Yeah. Bruce, the issue for me with Tyson Barry is he was the Oilers' weakest even-strength defender <laughs> last year. He was. And he was, and that's saying a lot because Caleb Jones really struggled on defense. Mm-hmm. And Ethan Barry had his moments before mm-hmm. coming on strong. But Barry... Barry was the weakest one. Mm -hmm. And um, can you play him in your top four and win in the playoffs? I mean, as the year went on, so so there's some fans who love this player and they, his puck moving is extraordinary. He really can move that puck. He, but as the year went on, he, and I don't know, was he trying to get the scoring title for NHL D man and, and raise his value, but he started to gamble more and more on defense as the year went on. I saw, and then the two on ones just came raining down on the owners when he was on the ice because of weak decisions that Tyson Berry made. We re- remarked on it often at the time. I think it's worth mentioning now he, he, there's major questions about him. So he is now the order's number one, right? D man. And he will remain that Cody CC is not going to take that job from him. He's going to remain that until Evan Bouchard, if and when Evan Bouchard ad- advances as a player in two or three years and takes that role from him. So in that way, there's a nice succession plan, Bruce, in that you have the veteran guy locked in. And just as he's aging out, his contract ends, you have Evan Bouchard. The The problem is, can he get the job done as a number one right shot D-man in the NHL? And that's a big question mark, especially on defense. So I... I uh, I love the offense. I love the fact that the Oilers have both Bouchard and Barry in the lineup at the same time. I really, I think they're both better offensive players than Ethan Bear. And sig- I think significantly better offensive players than Ethan Bear. That said, um, Ethan Bear is a pretty good defender, pretty reliable defender. And like, so when you balance out all the two way stuff next year, is Ethan Bear going to play better than Evan Bouchard or Tyson Barry? There's a real chance that he will play better than both of those two players. So, that's my first first take on that. Cody Cece signs a four-year deal, Bruce, at $3.25 million. First impression, Bruce McCurdy. Uh, first impression was that he had a, a pretty darn decent season in Pittsburgh last year, uh, but he did so in a reduced role after, uh, after struggling uh, in a top-four role for years in Ottawa, which, I mean, Ottawa, uh, but even for a year in Toronto, uh, and when Pittsburgh got him, they basically gave him uh, third pairing minutes, and he responded well. Uh, he was down around 18 minutes um, uh, on that pairing. Uh, he still had lousy shot shares, which he's <clears throat> always had, like 45%. Uh, but his goal share was great. Right? Like his percentages were in his favor at both ends of the ice. So that's something where you look at it and say, well, is that something, something that... Uh, uh, he was doing right or just something that went right for that particular year. And that, that, that's a, a stat that doesn't often have sustain, but we'll see. I mean, some veteran defenseman gets smarter. Uh, on the bright side, he's 27 years old and he's got 549 games in the NHL and a bunch more in the playoffs. So, you know, they're bringing in a good mid-career guy. My recollection is he's a guy that skates pretty well, uh, but he's more of a, a defense guy. He averages about 22 points a season, and last year he played uh, he played some on the penalty kill, and uh, and not at all really on the power play in Pittsburgh where they had other alternatives. Uh, so he fills you know they have a hole for that kind of guy on the right side. I would argue on the third pairing, except for they've got Tyson Berry that you would say maybe fits best on the third pairing, and they got Evan Bouchard who you'd say maybe fits best on the third pairing. And I'm wondering who in the hell is going to be on the top pairing? 
Well, maybe oh. it'll be Evan Bouchard. Maybe Evan Bouchard's just going to rock it up, Bruce, and like mm. Alex Pietrangelo, second coming right. of Alex Pietrangelo, and seize that top pairing job with Darnell Nurse this year. Hey, stranger things have happened in the NHL. Evan Bouchard is a hell of a prospect. Uh, mm. Would Dave Tippett give him that chance? Bruce, here's the weirdest stat in the world about Cody CC. 40th overall out of 100 and 200 NHL regular D-man for even strength scoring this year. Wow. Oh. This past year, 1.21 points per 60, tied with Victor Hedman at 40th. Right in there with players like um, uh, Morgan Riley, Colton Pareko, Victor Hedman, Quinn Hughes for even strength scoring this year. Now, here's the thing. In in a short season like this, and with defensemen in particular, Mm -hmm. even strength scoring is a pretty iffy stat for looking at a player's as a proxy for puck moving. Um, it can be warped by a lot of second assists that, that the player didn't really earn. So that's the, uh, what, how many minutes did he play? Uh, 800 and 845. So it's a fairly significant amount, but even over a season, like points, points uh, scored for a deem at even strength is, is can, can be an iffy stat. So, but that is a, it's, that's, that's kind of, Cool. I mean that that encouraged me a little bit. It was it's better than seeing him right at the bottom of the list, like you know Yari Hockenpah and some of the other guys that were mentioned as replacements are uh, right at the bottom of the list because you know if they're right at the bottom of the list, that's probably not a very good sign at all in terms of the player being a puck mover. And so I'll give him that. My Bruce, they're paying him like a second pairing D man, and he's. He's effectively blocked for four years. He's not blocking other players from taking that role, but he's certainly getting paid that way. So if Dmitry Samarukov comes along, mm-hmm. and as is likely, and starts knocking on the door, where's he going to fit on the orders? I mean, he can play the left side, fortunately, but they also have Philip Broberry there. So this is a factor in the whole thing. Like, does, does Cody CC in this big contract kind of block the way for other better players. The good news is you have these other better players, Bruce. And this is the one thing to keep in mind with the moving out of Caleb Jones and Ethan Bear. They came in, the coaches at least saw them. They didn't see enough to have these players stick with the orders, the orders, coaches and management. This is their decision, whether it's right or wrong. This is, if we're going to go along with what they're thinking, right. they didn't see enough. They gave these players plenty of opportunity. I would argue they didn't mm-hmm. see enough. They move them out. They're moving on to Duncan Keith. They're moving on to CeCe. They're moving on to Barry. These players are all iffy bets. Um, are they going to work out? I don't know. But the 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 the, the one crossed. thing, the one uh, silver lining here is if they don't work out, the Oilers could still have their bacon saved by Evan Bouchard, Philip Broberry, and Dim- Dmitry Samarukov. And they're going to get sheltered uh time in the AHL and in the bottom pairing in the NHL now to develop another year. But if the, if there are, it's not a total disaster, at least is what I'm trying to say. If some of these guys don't work out because I think the owners actually have brought strong prospects. And I think this might've been in part of the thinking in terms of being willing to trade Baron Jones. It's not like there was nothing after them. There are some guys that are, they're really hopeful to play well for the owners. Yeah, well, CC. I mean, I'm just looking at his stats here. Uh, last year, I mean, you talk about how his even strength scoring. Well, maybe one of the reasons he got good points was that opposing goalies just weren't making many saves. Uh, when he was on the ice, the opposing goalies had an 895 save percentage, and his goalie has 933. Like, it was just, you know, uh, night and day between what was happening at the two ends. Of the, and then he's plus 18, and that looks great on the surface, but you, you dig in a little bit, and it's all about, you know, shots going in as opposed to shot generation. So uh, we'll see on that front. Uh, uh, it's more to me, what does he bring on the defensive side of the puck? And uh, I, have, I have reasonable uh, hopes that, he, you know, he'll be decent in that role. I don't see him as a big banging shutdown type guy, but, I mean, there's more than one way to play defense. So, um, the goalie situation, Bruce, you know, a lot of these mm. moves are justified, including the Hyman move, like the orders are all in now. This is the, this is the, um, the framing that the organization has itself. We're all in. That's their yep. slogan. 
Uh, they got it all tattooed on their arms. And um, so they, if you're all in, I think you have to do better in net than what the Oilers have right now. You, Mike Smith, I, I, I'm okay with that signing. He played really well. Mm-hmm. We've seen older goalies who have had success continue to have success. There's a possibility that will happen with Mike Smith. I'm okay with that that uh, two-year deal for that reason. Uh, he he earned it based on his play last year. But you can't just put all your eggs in the Mike Smith basket. That's not going to work out. Uh, that's a very risky move on top of all these other risky moves the Oilers have made. If you're all in, I think you need one more goalie and you need a better goalie than, than Miko Koskinen is. So things are moving fast on the goalie front. With, yep. as you mentioned, it's Vitel Vanasek, I think, who's Vitek oh, right. Vanasek yeah, is the Seattle other, goalie. Yeah. Um, he could be on the market. I don't know what kind of bet he is. He's a young goalie, 908 save percentage last year in Washington, which is okay. But what was Koskinen? It's not much worse than that. And the year before, it was better than that. So is Dreger, though, Chris Dreger, on the market now? Olmark is still on the uh, the market. You, you figure Colorado is going to be going all out to, to bring in that goalie, and that would be awfully enticing to Linus Oldmark, you would think, the Buffalo goalie, to go to the Avs. So, Ooh, and God, after God, that, yeah. Yeah, after that, that maybe yeah. it is Dreger or Van- Maybe the best bet now is the Oilers trying to make a move. There's still Darcy Kemper. You'd probably have to give up. If you're going to move Koskinen for Kemper, you'd probably have to give up your first pick, the Oilers' first pick this coming year. I would I would be open to thinking about that trade. I mean, um, you'd have to know more about Kemper, how he's played recently, what his health is, to, to be sure about that. So that's my first impression. The Oilers, obviously they need a, a third center, but they I think they need a goalie here. What's your take? Yeah, they, well, the thing about signing Mike Smith to a two-year extension the way they did is if they do find a replacement for Koskinen and they sign him to any kind of a multi-year deal, now you've put up a roadblock to all the guys coming up. Like uh, Stuart Skinner has one more uh, waiver exempt season. Konovalov down there is thought to have a, a chance to make a real breakthrough. If you had Koskinen in it one more year and then gone, uh, there's a you know a path forward for those guys. If you if you have if you're locked up to uh, veterans at multi years, that really limits your options. So there, there you know that in the backdrop. Uh, that said, the idea of going out and getting, I mean, if they could somehow get a line of Solmark on the market, you know, more power to him, but he's going to be expensive. The prices that are being reported for players generally today is uh, is pretty wild. Here's, uh, here's a couple more, David. Jaden Schwartz, five years, $5.5 million. That's the same guy. Where? Uh, he went to Seattle. Wow. Yeah. So, oh wow, that is a lot of money for Jaden Schwartz. Yeah, and, I think and so. And Coleman, too. six years, four point nine million. Yeah, in Calgary. And Ryan Sutter, Bruce, the Ryan mm-hmm. Suter, the comparable mm-hmm. for Duncan Keith, four mm-hmm. years at what was it? Three point three point six five, I think I heard something like that. So maybe he also got Jake, Jake, Jake McCabe, so that Chicago signed to replace Duncan Keith on the left side, four years, four million. Wow. And uh, uh, one other one of interest here. Uh, Philip Dano, uh, gone to L.A. Kings, six years, thirty-three million. So How much? Six, six years, years, five point five million a year. I'm glad the Oilers didn't do that. Honestly, oh. I, I I think that was, he, I I mean he's a good defensive player, yeah. but that's a lot. That's a lot of money and a lot oh. of term for. The market is the market, and so it's you know, cra- it's a crazy market right now. Eh? It, it's gone Hallmark back to price pre- skyrocketing by the minute, probably. Yeah. So, so right now, Bruce and I couldn't be missing a player because I just did this quickly, and we've been really busy today. The Oilers, they're there. We got Hyman, R N H, Fogley, Benson, and Shore at left wing. Mm-hmm. McDavid, Drysaddle, McLeod, and Holloway at center. Pull you mm-hmm. RV. Yamamoto, Archibald, Cassian, and Marodi on the right wing. Mm-hmm. Marodi could be a center too. Barry, Cece, Bouchard, Samarukov, and Kessel ring. Right defense. Nurse, Keith, Russell, Lagasin, and Brobury uh, on left defense. And Smith, Koskinen, Skinner, Rodrigue, and Konovalov in net. Yeah, and Stalock. 
Oh, I didn't have steel. I will put them on my list right now. Thanks for reminding me. He pencils in at number three, to be honest. But yeah, he does. I'll put them there. Yeah. So and, yeah, that's that's about it. The left wing is, uh, I, to my mind, they've upgraded on left wing. They sure uh, have. They sure have. Uh, they really need to find a three C. None of those, uh, you know. I mean, maybe Dylan Holloway down the road, but not now. Maybe yeah. Ryan McLeod down the road. I think you're really jumping the. The gun to expect him to do that right away. 4C is great for Ryan McLeod this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, I don't mind him there at all. Not even a little bit do I mind Ryan McLeod at 4C. You got to get these young guys in and playing. In fact, I love it. Uh -huh. That's that's what I I, I love that. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. That's that's the spot that beckons Ryan McLeod. So, and I, you know, I like liking him to. Uh, a young Sean Horkoff. I remember Horkoff coming up, and he played four left wing when they first brought him up. They had to get him in the lineup somewhere, and they put him at left wing. After a while, he moved to 4C, and then he gradually worked his way up the lineup from there, 3C, 2C. But he was, you know, a, a Saturday draft pick that took a while to reach his potential, and that's basically Ryan McLeod's uh, lot in life right now is to work his way up. What do you think about if, if they don't sign another defenseman? Uh, lefty let's say they don't and they really if they're going to bring in a goalie and another center like money's going to get tight really fast here um russell and logason first impression if those are the top if those are if they're the th the 3d heading into the year what's your first impression on that bruce it's odd i hope dmitry samarkov is really really close because <laughs> Russell is, uh, you know, I just, I'm not sure that physically he can withstand the pounding of a full season. And if he's out for stretches, which he's proven in, in the past happens most years, if you're, if Lagasin is your one and only choice, uh, I just didn't see enough upside in that player last year for his, you know, advanced prospect status uh, to really be confident. At the same time, you know, I, you know, I don't mind that he's... Uh, He's getting that chance to develop uh, further, but I, you know I'd be surprised if he turns out to be a, a, a full-time NHL player in the long run. To be honest, wouldn't that be amazing if he did? Like if he yeah, if would. he if he continued to develop, because there's that possibility. Wild mm -hmm. Bill has got some. He's big. He's rugged. He can move the puck a bit. He's got to stay healthy, right? He keeps getting hurt. So, but if Wild Bill continued to develop, and and you know he is a cycle buster. I'll give him that. So he he oh. he brings the Oilers what they need more so than Chris Russell is. Yes. Uh, so Logason and Bouchard is a if if Logason can stay healthy and Russell. I mean, there's worse things because you do have Samarukov and Brobury as a fallback there. So they don't necessarily have to to bring in someone else. I don't think that's right. an urgent uh, urgent thing that they have to do. Be tempted to uh, at least consider, which I haven't seen him having signed anywhere yet, is uh, um, Kulikov. I didn't hate Kulikov. I thought he he had good numbers when he came from New Jersey. He, he mostly played well, and I think they need him more without Larson than putting him with Larson as they did. Uh, and he wasn't that expensive. On the other hand, his coach benched him for the last game of the playoffs, so he may be thinking that Edmonton's not the place for him. So, I I prefer Slater Cuckoo. I like uh, mm -hmm. Cuckoo's play better through the year. I thought right. he was a very reliable uh, third pairing D man and. Um, if they want that again, and there's nothing wrong with that, there's nothing wrong with having too much depth on defense because they always get injured. So uh, I wouldn't mind if the Oilers circle back to Slater Cuckoo and sign him again. That would be my, I would pick him over Kulikov. And against having seen him play for a year against, against other defense, similar kind of, you know, uh, replacement level D men in the NHL. I, I, I'm a, I'm on team Kulikuku. <laughs> I'm sure other people would agree with that. <laughs> Um, the pun that I just made, at least. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anything else, Bruce? Any other thoughts? Oh, I'm just tracking former Oilers signing elsewhere. Andrew Cogliano signed with uh, with uh, San Jose Sharks. Uh, oh, there he is again. He's up there twice. That's why I'm confused. Uh, uh, Drake Kajula signed a one-year deal. Where the heck was it? Anyway, I, I always track these guys where they go, uh, where they go down the down the line as uh, as their careers go. Uh, Laurent Brassois signed as a two-year deal, decent money in Vegas as the new backup to uh, wow. 
to um, Robin Leonard, with, of course, Mark andre Fleury, uh, now long gone. And uh, a few of them on this list here. Oh, Sam Gagne. Good old Sam Gagne signed a one year extension with Detroit. The lone survivor of the Athanasiu trade was the guy, the salary dump Edmonton sent the other way, who's now signed two more contracts in Detroit. So, <laughs> Kajula signed in Buffalo. So, anyway, it's just, uh, just uh, for Euler fanatics that are interested in subsequent careers of guys that made a stop here along the way. And I'm particularly interested in the guys who started here as opposed to it was at stop number six of a nine, nine team career, right? So. Here's my final thought, Bruce, on this whole thing. The order's goaltending is the same mm-hmm. risky bet um, that it was heading into last year. The Oilers defense is worse than uh, heading into this year than last year. Although with Bouchard um, coming on, there's a chance it's it's it will get it will be better because he's got such potential. And the Oilers forwards are significantly improved. Hyman, Mc, McDavid, Puliyarvi, top line, RNH, Drysaddle, Yamamoto, second line, Fogley, McLeod, Archibald, third line at this point, Benson, Holloway, Holloway and Cassian, fourth line at this point. These are the best orders forwards lines we have seen in a long, long time, at least heading into this coming season. Um, we'll see how RNH and Hyman last as as uh, strong NHLers, but that's a worry for another day. Right now, this forward group mm-hmm. is really ex- I, I, like just it cheers me up and makes me excited to look at that forward group. The left side is definitely better. The whole of three C. I mean, one solution is to move Nuge there and to find yeah. another left winger. You know, yeah. like at least that's an option, right? Have so, Holloway play there, you know, because it's a lot easier to play on the wing than it is at center yeah. to break in yeah. there or, you know, or McLeod yeah. even. So, yeah. Alrighty. Final thoughts from you. Is yeah, that it, what, yeah. One last, uh, uh, the team that's always in the eagle of my eye, Tampa Bay Lightning. Brian Elliott signed one year, $800,000, no, $900,000 to be their backup goalie. He's actually going to be a, a discount from Curtis McElhenney, the great backup goalie that they've had for the last couple of years. So they've just found another proven solid veteran who will take his place on the bench and play and play well when they need him. And they signed Zach Bogosian, three years, 850000 You don't hear three-year deals at that price very often, but that's what they can fit under their salary cap. And they got a solid guy that's won a Stanley Cup with them, a right-hand shutdown defenseman who can you know, fill in when needed. It's just so... Tampa Bay, both of those moves. It's just you're in breeze ball through and through. All righty, I'm, just, je- let's, I'm jealous. <laughs> we we didn't get one of their forwards, I guess, in the end. Eh? Uh, yeah, uh, no, I Tyler think. Johnson went to Chicago, and uh, they had traded Tyler Johnson and a pick to Chicago uh, for Brent Seabrook, who's injured and out forever. Oh, those that's how they, but that's how they got sneaky, salary sneaks. cap under their thing, and they'll just stash him on long term injured reserve with all the other. Runners. Wonder who they'll wa- they'll they'll have someone they can waive, and I guess it's always it's always fi- possible to even on a team as good as Tampa, probably fi- possible to find someone that someone else wouldn't pick up. Might be hard on Tampa actually because they're all pretty mm-hmm. good there. Like who are they going to waive to 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 do that kind of thing? Still but, another shoe to drop. Probably, yeah. To drop. So. Maybe the Oilers will still pick up a. Tampa forward, we'll see. So yeah, center. There's obviously the Oilers are going to make one more signing, at least at center. That's without a doubt. I suspect they'll get another lefty, and we'll see if they can make, uh, you know, if they can make it thunder uh, in in the net. Bring in an, uh, another goalie. Derek Ryan emerging as the favorite for the center. So yeah, it's by a process of elimination. Good, good on faceoffs. Can skate. He's fast. So shoots right. Shoots right. He, he uh, any he, but he's a little older, right? So that's that's yep, the issue. So yeah. so yeah, he should be a little cheaper. Is the thing. The good news is now, as of this moment, Bruce's prices should be starting to crash, right? Because this is where it gets starts to get mm-hmm. tough, and uh, maybe the owners can find uh, certainly for hopefully at center and another lefty, they could find a bargain player in net. They're going to have to pay if they're going to bring someone right. really really good in. Yep, and we have to figure. I have to have another hard look at. Uh, Puckpedia and see how much uh, cap space they have after all the dust has settled on today's move. So bargains are all well and good if you still have cap space. So 
there must be some. They didn't they didn't like totally break the bank on any one of these guys, but they they did spend. I mean, ten million between Hyman and Barry, and you know another three and a quarter, and then they got to pay Fogley. So that's like sixteen million for the four. It's it's interesting, eh? Because if a year ago you could have said the Oilers would have had Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Zach Hyman, and Tyson Berry for fifteen million dollars locked up, people would have said, "I'll I'll take that." That's that's because uh, yes. you know there was there was concerns Nugent might be seven seven and a half. Right. Hyman, I don't. This this would be a top end for Hyman, and, but Barry, you might think if he had a big year in Edmonton, it might be six million dollars a year. Yeah. So anyway. Apparently, he was the first player in NHL history to lead defense men in scoring and not get a single vote for the Norris Trophy. So that kind of tells you about Tyson Berry in a nutshell. And, and I think that was perfectly <laughs> rational and reasonable because he got a lot of those points on the power play. And he listen, he got a lot of second assists from rote passes at even strength. And I know some people don't like to hear that. They don't, mm-hmm. you know, they, they think that's oh. an overstatement. I don't believe that's an overstatement. He was a good offensive defenseman. He was a good puck mover at even strength, Bruce. Mm-hmm. Was he the best Oilers puck mover at even strength? Yes, he was. But he wasn't that much better than Darnell Nurse or Caleb Jones, for that matter. Caleb Jones was a really strong puck mover at even strength. So he he's not Caleb McCarr. I was just going to say, it's hard to get Norris Trophy votes when you're the second best defenseman on your own pairing. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. And that's all I meant. It's a slight as Tyson Berry. I just think it's a fact. Yeah. So. Uh, well, let's leave it there, Bruce. Maybe we'll yeah. be back today talking about a goalie. Did we get? Yeah. Did we get? We must have hit the 15 minute mark by now, did we? Uh, that was the plan. <laughs> we're going to do it. But I knew if that was the plan that we would do a 50 minute podcast, that we'd actually do a 40 minute podcast as opposed to an hour and 40 minute podcast. So. There you go. Uh, Already. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bruce, thanks for talking. Always good to talk to you. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast arena. Let me just shut this down. I think I'm in a kind of a strangely euphoric mood with all of this activity, Bruce. Mm. Stop recording. <laughs>